Hello, hello, hello. Once again, everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's get that camera going. All right. Hey, it is uh, once again Wednesday night webinar, everybody. So enjoy. Here we are. Be ready for the thrill of a lifetime, as we like to have every Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday night webinar is brought to you by No CD. No CD, a downloadable app you can get through Google Play or iOS. Please check us out. Through that app, you can get teletherapy. And that teletherapy is with licensed clinicians who know how to do ERP, the gold standard of treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder. So check us out if you are in Canada or the United States or in the UK or in Australia. Those are all the places we're doing work. And if you're outside of those places and need some help, reach out to us as well, too. And we will uh, see what we might be able to do for you. We were going to have a guest tonight, but uh, unfortunately, there's a family emergency. So uh, we will be f just flying solo with all of you and me. So um, happy to have all of you here. And let's get into it. Nastasia says, thank you for your super inspiring videos. Well, thank you very much. You have OCD, mental and physical compulsions. On your previous video, you had asked if we would believe you if you gave us health test results that were amazing and my answer was yes is it possible for me to have ocd in other areas and not health issues of course absolutely 100 percent. i think that i was probably doing that based on a question that was about someone who had health anxiety uh, health related ocd so that's probably where that came from but you don't have to have any particular types of ocd that i talk about to absolutely have OCD. You know, you may have contamination issues and you hear me talking about harm and I may some, say something about it. You go, well, I don't have that. So does that mean I don't have OCD? Nope. It just means you don't have that subtype of OCD that's going on in your life, but you may have other ones that are going on uh, instead. So uh, thanks for being here with us, uh, Nastasia. Good to see you. Chris says, you feel a lot better now after three months of treatment. Fabulous. However, you still get a lot of real event obsessions. Okay. And constantly have to check, boo, your intentions. Can It can be small situations throughout the day. I try not to do mental checking while doing ERP, but the fear is still too big to not compulse, which means you're still compulsing, which means, unfortunately... Um, What's happening is OCD is still sticking around. So, Chris, you say the fear is too big. Uh, I'd be interested, and I think that there's probably other people on here tonight that have used a phrase like that that says the fear is too big, the risk is too high to, to try it out. But I haven't yet, and I'm just using my own you know, personal clinical 23 years of doing this experience here, but I haven't yet had someone not do a compulsion and awful, horrible things occur because of it. Now, Chris, that doesn't mean you wouldn't be the first. And and I don't say that lightly or tongue in cheek or anything. I, I truly mean it. I mean, it is, it is possible, Chris, that you could not do a compulsion and something could happen, right? But that is frankly, possible for everyone as well, too. There are going to be coincidences now and then. OCD, of course, loves a coincidence and says, see, I told you. Look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go back to, you know, uh, for many of you who are aware that I have a card in my wallet that says, I hope my parents die tonight, please God, and has a 666 on it because I was working with someone one time who was afraid that if they had an intrusive thought about their parents uh, being harmed, that they would die, and then they would undo it through a scrupulosity based compulsion and they would say a prayer afterwards. And so uh, I invoked the deity that they believed in to smite my parents. Uh, my parents are still alive at this point. Now, there is going to come a point where my parents will die. And what that means is at some point that card is going to be correct. So, Chris, what we have to decide then is on the day that the card becomes correct, 
is the card responsible for the death of my parents or is that card just going to become correct at some point and that's just the way that it is right we have to make some decisions around that if if that's the case then that's the way that it is right the card is either responsible or there are coincidences now chris if you're doing this mental checking because you believe that the fear is too big you have the next step of erp to go to and the next step of erp to go to is to eliminate that mental checking because that mental checking is not helping you it is not making you better it continues to get in the way of you functioning the way that you would like to function so uh as long as you're doing that chris you're going to hold on to some ideas that that mental checking is being helpful to you and your ocd sticks around because you're still feeding the ocd now this is the next thing to work with your therapist on is how do you not do the mental compulsions right and that's where i would suggest chris that you go to next in the work that you're doing on your therapy lisa says hello dr mcgrath hello i have contamination ocd and i struggle with not acting out my ocd thoughts as my own and then i end up doing a compulsion and start spiraling down a hole so lisa um what if you didn't do the compulsion what would happen now similar to chris you might say worst awful horrible things could occur uh, worst case scenarios could absolutely happen people could die or be harmed and um you know okay there there's potential for all of those things uh, i suppose whether we do a compulsion or not do a compulsion because last time i checked i just want to make this pretty clear um anyone who has ocd also has people in their families get sick and die and get in car accidents and all these other things happen too. So if, if OCD worked in the protective mechanism that it is, people with OCD and their family should live well into their two to three hundreds because OCD would have kept people alive for so long. Now here's the out that OCD uses. And that out is this. If you would do the compulsions consistently, that would happen. But once in a while, you miss one. And when you do, that's when the bad thing happens. Now, this stinker of a disorder, OCD, right, does this very thing. You know, this is this is what it does. It gets you, right, to believe all good things come from obsessive compulsive disorder. And all negative things come from not following the rules of obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay. Now, if that were true, if it really did work that way, my job would be quite opposite of the job that I have right now. My job would be to give people obsessive compulsive disorder. My job would be to say, you know, it appears things aren't going as well as they could. I have a solution for you to make it better than it is. Have you considered going for some OCD, right? Why don't you add some OCD into your life and that will make everything all better, right? You know, you really want to make sure somebody doesn't get hurt or die or anything like that. Compulsions appear to work very nicely. Now, I would be kicked out of my profession, lose my license if I were to say all of those things, right? So I'm I'm not going to say that because A, it's just stupid and wrong. And, and B, I would be falling for the tricks that OCD wants you to fall for as well too, which is again, OCD wants you to believe that you and OCD are best friends. And if you want things to go really well in your life, do more of what OCD wants instead of less. Okay. 
Jay says, working on my car today, or a car today, I'm pretty sure you torqued them to the specs, but your OCD keeps telling me, are you sure? What if they crash? Had to tell my manager. I've been thinking about it nonstop. Feel better, but my OCD always plays worst case scenarios, and now I need to know. I even told my manager if he can check to see if the cameras work so I can see if it shows me torquing the wheels. Always second guessing. Well, boy, what a great example of what OCD is, right? I think maybe the tag, we, we can come up with a new tagline for OCD. Always second guessing, right? Uh, it, it is always going to a second guess because it is always going to doubt. And OCD would love if there was a camera working to show that, yes, you actually did it to the way that you were supposed to do it. But, oh, Jay, I think we all know this. Even if you watch the camera, you would say, oh, wait, but did I have it on the right spot? Was it on the right nut? Uh, did I do that one torque only uh, three quarters of the way and that next one was a uh, 92% torque and the other one was 104% torque or, you know, you, you wouldn't even be able to tell that fully from watching the video. And believe me, you would have doubts about it, right? <laughs> you would absolutely, absolutely have doubts about it. So Jay, 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 there is no ability here to fully give you what you want, which is the absolute feeling of certainty that you did something the right way. That's just not going to happen, okay? And, and Jay, I want you to really, really understand this. I want you to absolutely pay attention to this, Jay. You have the doubting disorder and the doubting disorder is going to doubt all things that you want certainty about. And no matter what answer you give the doubting disorder, the doubting disorder will doubt that answer because the nature of the doubting disorder is to doubt absolutely everything. Jay, you cannot get to a point where your OCD is going to go, oh, well, we've now been given enough information. Thank you so much. This is great. All is well. Feel very content and confident in everything. We're good. It doesn't, doesn't work that way, Jay. It doesn't work that way. OCD lives on second guessing and... Because OCD lives on second guessing, it wants you to follow along in the second guessing. And every time that you go along with the second guessing, you're feeding the OCD. And it's just sitting back, having some snacks on doubts and insecurities and what ifs and all those things and reassurances and saying, you know, Jay, this is really good. This, Jay, what a responsible auto worker you are, Jay, to, to doubt if you've done something right, to worry about somebody crashing, to telling your manager that you might ha not have done something exactly the right way, to watch the tape of the work that you've done, right, and to maybe in the future demand that anytime you're working on a car, someone is right there next to you watching everything that you do. Jay, this is a great way to get fired too, right? And, and I don't mean that lightly. I'm not just I'm not making fun here or anything like that. But that's where I've seen things like this lead to for people where there are so many doubts and so many insecurities and so many demands on management to double check and to look at film and all those things that eventually sometimes people with OCD have worked themselves out of a job because of all their doubts and insecurities. And then guess what OCD says? You idiot. How'd you lose your job? I mean, what the hell? If you'd known how to do your job the right way, you wouldn't have lost your job. But you couldn't even tell if you'd, you know, torqued a wrench right. You needed me even with that. And, and look, I tried to help you, but 
you obviously screwed that up and now you've lost your job. How are we going to live? What are we going to do? Hmm. I'll start throwing some doubts at you that way to see if it motivates you to try to figure something out, right? If if any of you in any way whatsoever believe that OCD gives a crap about you or your interests, please just dispel that myth right now. OCD doesn't care. It just does not care about you, how you're feeling, anything of that nature. It cares about itself. It is a selfish jerk that is only focused on itself. Matthew says, Thanks you thank you for your help. You are brilliant. Well, you know, Matthew, if I was if I had a dollar for every person who told me I'd brilliant, I'd I'd have a dollar. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I, I now I now have a dollar. I appreciate it. <laughs> Any tips on how to deal with the is it really OCD stage that I always seem to get after getting on top of a theme? It can always drag me back into ruminating. Of course it can, right? Because again, that is the nature of the doubting disorder is even when you're doing better to go, but are you sure? How can you really tell 100%? What if you're wrong? Maybe you goofed up, right? Maybe you're just fooling yourself. Or maybe these doctors really are just jerks who like to torture people and have them do things and watch people get hurt. And yeah, you know, it it gets to be overwhelming and infuriating where OCD goes in these types of situations. Because, again, OCD doesn't want to go away, right? It's going to pull out every stop that it can to stick around. So it's an interesting theme tonight that we've seen in all these questions so far. The second guessing, right? Uh, Dragging me back into ruminating all of these things that (coughs) that OCD does to you know, bring people back into the fold of OCD. But I'm going to implore all of you to not give in to those compulsions. Even though OCD will be screaming at the top of its lungs at you going, you have to do the compulsion because if you don't, what if the bad thing happens and it's your fault because of that. Remember, OCD lives in the what-if world. And in the what-if world, if you're responsible for something bad, what a terrible, awful, horrible person you are for being responsible for the bad, awful, horrible things. And, and no one wants to be responsible for bad or awful or horrible things. We None of us want to carry that burden around with us that we're the cause of something bad or awful or horrible happening. I don't know anybody who likes that. But OCD has almost a phobia of that. That can't happen here. That can't happen to us. That would be the worst thing ever. Well... Maybe it is to OCD, but it doesn't mean that it actually will be the worst thing ever. Okay? Keep that in mind. We're at our 20-minute mark. Just a reminder to once again, everyone, tonight's webinar brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app. You can get through Google Play or iOS. Check us out at NoCD dot com or treat my ocd.com if you're looking for teletherapy. We also work with other disorders outside of OCD, such as, here we go, trichotillomania or hair pulling, excoriation or skin picking, hoarding, ticks. And uh, we're, we're going to be dabbling in a few other uh, things that we're, we're doing some pilot testing on too. So we'll have some info coming out soon on some of the other things that we'll be working on as well too. And we uh, also, one of the cool things that I think is there for those of you watching who have a family member who might not quite be ready for primetime therapy, and 
you want to learn about OCD and what you can do to start, you know, implementing even some of the tactics maybe throughout the household, we could do a no CD 411 session or a no CD education session with you. And we'd be happy to help provide that education and information to you uh, as well. Crappie says, I try not to do the compulsion, but my anxiety is so bad and it feels so real. Thank you, Crappie. I was I hadn't heard anyone say feels so real uh, yet today. So there we have it. Um, and all of you could go back to almost any one of these webinars and watch me talk about it feels so real and why it feels so real because it has to feel so real because if it didn't feel so real, I don't have a job, right? Oh, this thing doesn't really actually bother me so much. Oh, okay. Well, um, maybe I'll just move along. All right, great. Well, good session. Nice, nice talking to you. You know, all, all the best, right? You know, it, it has to feel real. It's going to feel real. No matter what it is. And don't search around looking for other people to see, do they seem to believe it more than me? Or do I seem to believe it more than them or anything like that? You know, OCD loves a comparison. OCD, <laughs> there was, I think I've told this story here before, but there was one day at the hospital. And throughout the day, four different people came up to me and said, you know, Dr. McGrath, um, my OCD is probably the worst you've ever seen in your career. I'm I'm thinking it's it's really really awful and horrible and I I don't think you or anybody else can really help me uh, because of how bad my OCD is. I said okay. Yeah. When you hear it once, you're like, well, it's an average day. When you hear it twice, interesting. Three times, theme. Four times, it's like, all right, I got to do something about this. So at the end of the day, I brought those four people into a room instead of second sending them to the checkout room. I brought them into a room and I said, all right, each of you have told me you have the worst OCD I've ever seen in my career. I'm just going to sit back and let the four of you fight it out and decide who's, who's actually the worst that I've actually seen in my career. And then we'll go from there. And of course, every one of them stuck to their guns that theirs was the worst. They couldn't agree. And after watching that for a while and just getting a kick out of watching everybody argue about it, I said, None of you have the worst OCD I've ever seen in my career. And therefore, let's stop wasting our time on that. And let's focus on what we're going to do to get rid of OCD. Right? That's what we need to do. Unfortunately, because things felt so real to certain people, they just held the notion that because it feels so real, there's nothing I can do about it because how can I do a compulsion to something that feels so real? Or how can I not do a compulsion I should say, to something that feels so real? And the answer is by not doing a compulsion, right? But that doesn't go over well for people. People don't like that idea. So we'll continue to work on pushing people toward this notion of we're not here to do more compulsions. We're here to do less compulsions, right? We're not here to stick to compulsions. We're here to move away from compulsions. And we want to get people to recognize that whatever thoughts or images or urges are in their head, whatever they are, it doesn't have to mean something about that person or say anything about that person, right? Very often we talk about the notion that OCD is ego dystonic, meaning I really don't like these thoughts or images or urges that I'm having. I don't want them. I don't find them to be pleasant or anything whatsoever. I would like them to go away. All right. Then, you know what? What are we going to do to get them to go away? Well, we're not going to tell them to go away, right? Because then we're engaging with them. We're going to recognize that they're there and we're going to move on and live our life is what we really want to do. move on and live our life. Now you might say, well, isn't that avoidance? No. Living your life is never avoidance. Okay, Living the life that you want to live, not the OCD life, is never avoidance. It's allowing yourself to learn that OCD can be along for the ride, but doesn't have to be in control of the drive. <laughs> and that's where you want to go with that. 
uh crappy says i try not to do the compulsion but my anxiety is so bad it feels oh we did that. okay so that was that one um let's see mick mick's got a couple things. <coughs> mick says have been aggressively doing erp for months now but still having extreme difficulty with everyday tasks like washing hands and showering which means potentially there's some mental compulsions or things going on that are getting in the way of the learning that we're going for a hypnotic state takes over my mind that truly blocks my efforts of doing ERP in these situations. When these trance-like states are finally completed, I have no recollection of working, uh, or I have no recollection of what took place during those periods, nor do I know what caused the trance to end. So, Mick, one of the things that you might want to first work on is some interoceptive exposures that are designed to help people with derealization or depersonalization. And those could be things like watching um, natural hallucination on YouTube. It's a great YouTube. I, I would show it here, but when you're showing it from YouTube through another uh, provider or screen or something like that, and then people are watching it, it just it just doesn't come through the way that it's supposed to. So go on YouTube, check out Natural Hallucination is one of the ways that we do this. Follow the prompts on it. The other piece is we have people uh, do some long-term hyperventilation. We have people stare at a dot until their eyes cross. There's There are several really great interoceptive exposures out there, Mick. But Mick, well, I think what you need to do first is to deal with this depersonalization or derealization before you're going to be able to do any of the other things. Because if you're going into that state and then this kind of stuff is happening and you have no recollection of it and, and you don't know what caused it and it might even be difficult for people to wake you up out of it, you're not going to be really engaged in great ERP going on in that situation. You're probably going to be engaged in fear of when am I going to have this, this uh, hypnotic state kind of experience take over. So Mick, I want you to work on interoceptive exposures for derealization or depersonalization first, and then go back to working on some of the, the stuff that you would do for uh, OCD. I think you would find that to be helpful. Uh, Deadpool Gaming, uh, I just got the second one, not the first one, where it says, how long does recovery take for this? So I'll see if something else comes up in the future. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, next one. <coughs> Hello, do you think there is any correlation between nutrition and OCD? Sure, I, I think there's correlations between those things. Uh, I wrote about that a little bit in my book as well, too. And do we have definitive answers about all of those things? Not yet, but I'm excited that we would want to do research to learn more and more about nutritional levels and occurrences of OCD. Uh, and I think that that would be really fascinating. So I hope it's something that, that people continue to want to research and want to focus on because uh, I do believe that there would be some kinds of relationships there. <laughs> Taylor says, I just feel like I struggle with so many subtypes of OCD. I'm tired of feeling this way. It can feel overwhelming. I know, Taylor, and that's why I love doing this kind of work here with people to show folks that even if you have multiple subtypes, not just a subtype, there's great treatment available. So, Taylor, I, I hope that you are seeing someone who could be helpful to you and you aren't just struggling with OCD, but you're learning how to live with OCD being there, but again, not letting OCD drive the car that you're in. And that's where we would want. So Taylor, please reach out to us at nocd.com. Be happy to see what we can do to work with you to find a therapist and um, help you through this IOP kind of experience. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> when I say IOP kind of experience, I mean, maybe even more intensive work than you would normally get. One of the things that we do at NoCD is we try, if we can, and schedules permitting and everything, but we try to front load some sessions with people, try to make it more intense at the beginning. Uh, and and we can we can really kind of personalize the, some of that scheduling with people as well too. So if you need something to that level, uh, we could even try to work on that or we have good referrals for programs as well too. 
Jess says, can you have OCD characteristics but not have a disorder? Of course, everybody has quirks or things of that nature. You overthink a lot and Google a lot when you're worried about things, which you know can be considered a compulsion, but feel like it's more so anxiety. So yes, Jess, absolutely. And if you're more to the point where it's kind of episodic or something, it's not every day, it's not overtaking your life on a daily basis, I don't know that I would categorize it as OCD. But Jess, if even in those experiences you're describing where it's not necessarily happening every day, but when it does, it is interfering in your life, it's still a treatable experience for you and something that I would say absolutely reach out to a good ERP-based therapist who works on anxiety and can help you with overcoming some of those characteristics that you're describing. Amelie says, when treatment asks you to not pray, but you want to have a connection with God, how can this work? Well, uh, Amelie, is, is prayer the only way to have a connection with God? Would be my first question, right? Because I, I know many people who say that they feel a connection to some type of higher power uh, just by living, right? Not even having to pray. When a therapist asks people not to pray, usually, and, and, and I'll go based on myself, it's because the prayers that are being said are no longer prayers, they're compulsions. You may believe that they're prayers. It may feel as if they're prayers. But when I look at them from the outside, they are nothing but compulsions. They are being done to try to neutralize some kind of discomfort that somebody has about an intrusive thought or image or urge. Right? And that's what's happening is a compulsion, not a prayer. Now, I also don't want anyone hearing this to think, oh my gosh, they're trying to take me away from my religion. No, I want you to live in the religion that you have. I want you to, to commune with your higher power in the best way that you possibly can without the interference of obsessive compulsive disorder having any role in that whatsoever. My goal is absolutely to get you back into the religion of your choice, the practice of that faith in, in, in that you choose. That is what I want. But I also need to point out when OCD has bastardized some of the practices that happen in certain faiths and has turned them on their side, and now it's, you know, interfering to the point of can I even practice my faith anymore? Should I even go to church anymore? Should I even believe this anymore? You know, And that just adds more doubt and more insecurity and all of these types of things as well, too. Okay. So good luck with that, Amelie. And know this. Our goal is not to remove you from prayer for the rest of your life. Right? I've even set it up with certain people. I've, I've said, okay, here's the deal. You could say a one or two minute prayer in the morning when you wake up, and you could say another one or two minute prayer when you go to sleep at night, just to, you know, say to your higher power, thank you for being a part of your life and that you appreciate their guidance. But everything else in the middle, no prayers, because the likelihood is those things in the middle are actually compulsions. So, Amelie. I know it sounds like someone's asked you not to pray, but I'm wondering if someone has actually asked you not to compulse. Because not all prayers are prayers. Some prayers are compulsions. Okay. Stephanie says, pedophilic OCD here. I have periods where you are fine, and then bam, I get a thought did I do X, Y, Z way back when and don't remember doing it? So there's a false memory component there, it sounds like as well, Stephanie. Sometimes I can let the thought go, but other times I latch on and obsess. Yes. And we want to get to always being able to uh, let go 
of the thought, right? Always being able to say, oh, well, that was strange and interesting. Okay, whatever, and moving on. Now, OCD defines a danger in that, right? And the danger that OCD throws into that is this. But what if you do suddenly remember something and now you're removing the opportunity to be able to make amends for that thing, right? What if after these years and years, you just don't remember something? And then suddenly, bam, you do, right? And and so then wouldn't it be best to go on and uh, you know find that person and say, I'm sorry, and pay for their therapy that they might need or, or throw myself in jail at the mercy of the court for having done something, right? Um, Stephanie, could I ever give you an answer, right? Where if I said to you, I 100% absolutely know for sure that you did not do X, Y, and Z back on X date. Stephanie, would that be enough? Now, you might say, well, you don't really know me, and you've not followed around my life on a day-to-day -day basis, so there's no way you can give me that guarantee. And you're right, right? But but I could come back and say, well, I've done a lot of research, and I've interviewed people who know you and were with you and everything like that. And then maybe I could even bring those witnesses in, and they could all say, say Stephanie, we, we guarantee that you did not do this thing. It, it didn't happen, right? Um Would there be a point, Stephanie, where you would believe it to be true? Okay. Is the goal to have absolute certainty? Is the goal to recognize that it's okay not to have absolute facts and certainty? And you have a question below you from Alexia. Do you think false memories can come on as flashbacks and images? And the more you ruminate on them, they come in many more graph graphic and you can possibly make a story with them, like connect them. I don't see why that couldn't happen, right? I don't see why there couldn't be something that would be a reminder to you of something that's happened in the past. You know, I, I've told stories on here about memories, right? Uh, another one this weekend. So uh, back when I was uh, in high school, I worked at a grocery store. And one of my friends has this massive, just like phobia of mustard, right? And someone had clipped one of the end caps at the store and a couple of the glass jars of mustard had fallen and were broken on the ground. Now, I remember, you know, working on it and him coming around the corner and me being like, dude, go away. Don't, you know, and, and we were talking about it this weekend, but he remembers it as he was working on it and he paged me to come over there to help because he couldn't handle it because it was mustard and it was just disgusting as heck to him and he needed some assistance. So Stephanie and Alexia, who has the right memory and who has the false memory? And how much should I put on pause anything in my life right now until I figure it out, until I know 100% sure, oh, yes, Chris actually has the correct memory and I do not. Or, oh, no, Chris, you are wrong. My memory was actually the way that it went down. So go, you know, do two laps around the building for being wrong or, or something like that, right? You know, just um, is there a way, Stephanie and Alexia, to convince me or Chris 
who have opposite memories of this experience, that one of us actually has the correct one? Or can we just live in the doubt and uncertainty about it? Because frankly, it, it really has no bearing on my life. And so I'm going to just live in the doubt and the uncertainty about it. But I'm wondering for someone who has OCD, how much the OCD screams at you inside. Doubt and uncertainty are not options. They are evil and wrong. And you absolutely 100% must do anything that you can to prevent them from happening. There should never be doubt. Ever. You should never have doubt. And I'd like to see, uh, there's 104 people on here right now. Is there anyone on this webinar tonight who is without doubt of anything in their entire world? Or is there anyone on this webinar who has achieved somewhere in their life 100% certainty about something to the point that no doubt could ever shake them ever whatsoever and no amount of other stories or even examples could could move them even a millimeter off of their absolute certainty right because that's what ocd wants ocd wants absolute certainty who's achieved it right? and if you have put it in the comments what have you achieved absolute certainty on that you've no longer experienced any doubt and how did you do it or is it only maintained because of a compulsion let's see what we get Stephen said you've had severe hyper awareness and somatic ocd around your swallowing for about 10 years what does treatment look like for this what does accepting uncertainty look like for hyper awareness so Stephen. Uh, I would want to know what you do when you swallow. Like, what what is the experience like? Are you listening to see if it sounds correct? Are you checking in your tongue movements or your throat what it's like when you're when you're doing that? Uh, I want to kind of know the full mechanism that's going on there, and then what are the compulsions that are being done, and the checking that's being done to assess if it's being done correctly. And I'd also, Stephen, want to know the fear that you have if you didn't do it correctly what would occur, right? What would happen? Is it that you would choke to death, you would die, something of that nature? And Stephen, I, I'm wondering this, in the last 10 years that you've spent focusing on this, which could be a significant amount of time every day as well too, um, as, as that's been happening, have you been living the life that you want to live or have you been living the life that your OCD wants you to live? And as again, to quote my favorite movie, Shawshank Redemption, uh, right up there with uh, Caddyshack, two greatest films ever. Uh, how, are you getting busy living or are you getting busy dying? Right. You know, are you focusing on what you can do to live the life that you want to live? Or are you focusing on living the life that OCD wants you to live and making sure that you're fulfilling that everything OCD wants is happening? You have to decide here, right, Stephen? Uh, is there a way to swallow correct? Sure, because people do it all the time. And they also do it without thinking about it. Once you start thinking about it, I think it's very hard to find a way that you could swallow correct. And I say that because once you bring something like swallowing into consciousness, it's very difficult to feel as if you've done it the right way or blinking or swinging a golf club or anything like that. Things that you just want to kind of have happen and just kind of naturally do become very difficult to naturally do when you put so much thought and attention and focus on them. Okay. So 
a therapist would work with you, Stephen, probably on maybe even over exaggerating the problem. You know, every time you swallow, you want to doubt if you did it right. And what would your life be like if you never swallowed right again for the rest of your life, right? What would it actually be like? I would bet it would be this. You would still get food down your throat. It would get into your gut. It would be digested and you would have bowel movements and the circle of life would continue. So even if you didn't do it exactly just correctly, the likelihood is that it would still work, right? But are you willing to test that, Stephen? You have to decide. Are you willing to put that out there and take a test on that and see how that goes? Taylor says, how do I just overcome having feelings of dread with harm OCD? I would say by doing ERP exposures to the things you're afraid about harm, right? You know, you will, you will dread things. You will not look forward to things. But the more that you do ERP and the more you learn not to dread or, or to be afraid of things, the broader your life gets which means you have less opportunity for dread from harm OCD if that's the case. So maybe that's what you want to be doing, Taylor, is to make sure you're doing more and more ERP all the time. Star 28 says, hey, Patrick. Hey, I signed up for therapy via no CD. Great. You're excited to get started. Awesome. Do all your therapists use ERP to treat their patients? We do. Yep. And that's what we do here at, at, at no CD. We, we're using ERP. Absolutely. Grace says you're having a hard time having a good attitude about ERP. Any tips for how to keep a good outlook while you're doing what you don't want to do? Uh, yeah. Do you what's your what's your awesome attitude, Grace, with having OCD run your life? Because I'm gonna bet that's a lot of also doing what you don't want to do, which is compulsions. Even though in the moment you want to do them because you've been convinced that they feel well and they're a good thing to do. In the long term, I'm betting that you really dislike them and wish that they would go away. So, Grace, you could look at, you could have an outlook of life with OCD and you can have an outlook of life without OCD. But in order to get to the outlook of life without OCD, you're probably going to have to do a few things that you're not really interested or comfortable with in order to make sure that you actually are protected from. Uh, all of those things that OCD wants you to do. But when I say protect, you know, build that, build that uh, shield around you through ERP of being able to let things bounce off of you and not have to, you know, spend so much time thinking about them, but just getting to a point of, oh, OCD threw that at me. Well, boom, that just bounced right off the shield because I've worked on that so much now with my therapist that, hey, that's really no big deal whatsoever doesn't really bother me, right? So that's what I want you to do, Grace. I'm going to bet you're not going to have a great attitude about having OCD the rest of your life. And I'm not surprised that you might not have a great attitude about doing ERP right now as well, too. But at least that one can offer you something different and probably offer you the thing that you want, which is no more OCD Versus doing what OCD wants you to do doesn't offer you the chance to have no OCD. It just offers the chance to have more OCD is what it does. CS, is it possible for OCD to latch on to a specific person? Sure. There's people who think that uh, other certain people are contaminated and they want to stay away from them or things that they've touched. And that can be physical contamination. That could be emotional contamination as well, too. All, all sorts of things. So, yeah, absolutely. We've seen that. Marie says, I'm dealing with severe contamination right now, and it follows me around like the plague. Well, that would be contaminating to have the plague, too. I mean, I've heard that was very contaminating. Uh, I'm in ERP therapy. However, it is so hard, afraid to take medication. Any tips? So, Marie, what's hard about therapy? I want you to really kind of take a look at making some decisions around what is really hard about doing ERP. Is it that it's getting you to challenge what the OCD lies are? Because the OCD lies are presented to you in such a nice fancy package that they're very easy to believe as being true. 
Or can you get to a point where you don't have to believe any of the things that OCD tells you, right? Now, maybe you're at a point where, okay, you know what? Uh, OCD is following me around. It is hard. So today's little step that I'm going to do is this. I'm going to do this tiny little thing today that's different than what I've done before. And then tomorrow, what's another tiny little you know thing that you can add to that? And what's a tiny little tweak you can add to that? And then another tiny little tweak you can add to that. That's how I want you to think about it, Marie. You don't have to make massive steps here on a daily basis, Marie. I want you to think about the small incremental things that you, Marie, can do every day to make one thing a little bit more difficult than what it was, right? You might feel just slightly more contaminated than you did the day before, every single day, maybe for years, right? Um, I can tell you, I have done some amazingly fantastic contamination exposures with people, and uh, I have become physically contaminated. I have become emotionally contaminated, at least according to the people that I'm working with, and yet have not suffered any ill consequences of any of those experiences whatsoever, as far as I can tell. Now, maybe I'm fooling myself, right? It is a possibility, so I'm going to I'm gonna leave it at that. But I'm going to bet I'm not, and that I could learn just like anybody could to have these kind of contamination thoughts and be able to do one of two things about them. Really focus on them so that I can constantly be paying attention to them to make sure those things don't happen, or go, oh, okay, and move on. And there's some people in the first camp and there's others in the second camp. And how can I get you to be more in the second camp? You don't have to just be all willy-nilly and be like, well, I'm just going to go out and touch everything and then lick my fingers. No, I, I don't need that to happen, right? That isn't the way that it has to go. I, there are some therapists who do those things, right? I, and and I've had fascinating debates with them about how far do you go in ERP with, in these types of things. So I'm not saying I would have to have you do some of that type of stuff. But what I do at least need you to do is to face that contamination that you fear is there and learn that you can handle that contamination that you fear without having to do compulsions. That's what I need you to do. Okay. Casey says, you've gotten a point after therapy with no CD, uh, which helped you. Uh, feel independence, which helped. Okay. But you feel like an independent scenario may be the best for me. And also with your depression. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. An inpatient scenario may be the best for you with your depression. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, well, Casey, I would work with your therapist to see, you know, is there, there's lots of levels before you even have to go inpatient, right? So you know, CD therapy can be multiple times a week. Uh, you can step up to an intensive outpatient program. There's partial hospital programs, and then there's even also inpatient programs. Uh, but those are not usually for OCD, just so you know. The inpatient programs are not usually for OCD. The inpatient programs are usually to stabilize people who may be a danger to themselves or others with depression. And then what you would see for more living away from home for OCD is what we call a residential treatment center for OCD. And they could do that alone or in combination with depression and mood issues as well too. Excuse me. And so um, if you're looking for something like that, Casey, the International OCD Foundation, iocdf.org, has a website that has a list of all sorts of different places that you can go to for, for those types of help. But you can work with your therapist on that as well too. Jeremy says, how do I approach obsessions centered on a fear of not being able to sleep? This fear feels validated at times because obsessions do keep you up at night sometimes. You feel a bit stuck. Jeremy, I want you to do good sleep hygiene. And here's some good sleep hygiene for everyone, okay? Number one, 
beds are for sleeping and uh, the fun stuff. That's it, right? You don't read in bed. Don't watch television in bed. Don't lay in bed and worry and think. If you go to bed and you're asleep or you're not asleep within 15 minutes, get out of bed and go do something or go sit in a chair and read or something like that. But do not go to bed and not sleep or have the fun stuff, right? <laughs> because those should be the only two things that you're using beds for, okay? We know this because you can start to condition yourself to lay in bed. And if all you do is worry in bed all the time, just seeing your bed can be a, a link toward starting to worry. There's some conditioning again that goes on there. So we got to decondition the bed away from the place that you go to think and worry and, uh, you know, have all of these fears about not being able to sleep or something like that. You want that to occur occurring somewhere else other than in the bed. I think we have time for one more and then we'll wrap up here tonight. Uh, Michelle says, your 12-year-old son had his first therapy session this week. I know it will take time, but any advice on how to handle outbursts as you pull back from accommodating his OCD, everything you say angers him more. Uh, Michelle, I believe we've got a support group also here at NoCD for parents in this type of situation. So check us out for that. Um, ask your therapist about it. And let's see if we can get you into that. But it is tough, right, Michelle? And, and I just really want to support you and say, A, you know, good job, right? Um, this is going to be a very thankless period for you as a caretaker right now because the OCD is going to lash out. Now, here, Michelle, I want you, I want you to really hear me here. I want you to pay attention to this very significantly. You may hear yourself called names or threatened, or all sorts of things. Know that that is all coming from the OCD, not your son. That is the absolute terrorizing fear that OCD is instilling in your son. And your son making last-ditch efforts of begging and pleading for you to fulfill what OCD wants, because if you don't, then horrible, awful things might happen. That's what the OCD believes. So, Michelle, you're going to hear some really crappy stuff, right? You're going to have outbursts. You're going to be called names. There might be hitting, something of that nature. Know that all of it is a ploy to break you down, to ultimately give in to what OCD wants, which is for you to assist with compulsions and to make accommodating behaviors. Now, Michelle... I'm going to move this to drugs or alcohol. Imagine if your child was an addict and they started berating you because you would no longer buy them alcohol. You would no longer stock it in the house. You found their IDs, you ripped them up, and you now control their money so that they can't go out and get alcohol. And, and your son was yelling and screaming at you. Would you say, okay, fine, here's some alcohol? Probably not. I would I would hope not, right? I would hope not. And it's that kind of strength and fortitude to bring into this situation as well. All right, everyone. It's been another fun Wednesday with all of you. Thanks for joining, as always, our Wednesday night webinar. We will be here next week, even though it's the holiday, uh, night before the holiday. Of course we're going to be there because why, why wouldn't we be, right? It's going to be a fun time. So Come on back again next week. We look forward to seeing everybody and check us out at NoCD. You can go to NoCD.com or you can download the NoCD app. We've got openings for therapy. If anybody's interested in doing teletherapy, strike while the iron's hot. Now's the time, everybody. Come on in and let's work with you. Good to see you again, everyone.